Hey guys, welcome back. I hope you are having an amazing day. Let's get right into the stories. The first one is an entitled people story. When I first moved into my new house, I was ecstatic. It was my dream home, a beautiful two-story house with a big backyard. I couldn't wait to turn the backyard into my own little oasis, complete with a vegetable garden, flower beds, and a privacy fence. After living there for about a month, I received a notice from the Homeowners Association that my partially built fence violated Homeowners Association rules. Apparently, fences could only be chain link or white picket, and mine was made of nice cedar planks. I went to talk to the Homeowners Association board to see if we could find a compromise, but they refused to budge. The head of the board, Barbara, was the biggest stickler. With her pinched face and shrill voice, she reminded me of every Karen meme I'd ever seen. Absolutely not, she squawked when I asked if a natural wood fence would be allowed. It must be torn down immediately, no exceptions. I tried explaining how much time and money I had invested in the fence already, and that it matched my home's aesthetic perfectly, but she didn't care. Everyone must follow the rules, no exceptions. Now take down that horrid fence or we'll do it for you and charge you for the work, she threatened. With no other choice, I reluctantly tore down the fence I had worked so hard to build. Hundreds of dollars of lumber and two weekends of hard work gone to waste, just to satisfy Barbara's power trip. Over the next few months, Barbara constantly found new things to harass me about. My grass was half an inch too long. I parked my car in the driveway overnight. I left my trash cans out past 6 p.m. on pickup day. Her obsessive rules and shrill tirades made me dread coming home to my own house. The final straw came when I caught Barbara snooping around my backyard one day. She claimed she was doing an inspection to make sure I hadn't violated any rules. I'd had enough of her spying on me and trying to control every little thing I did on my own property. That's when I decided if Barbara wanted to play hardball, I could play too. I studied the Homeowners Association bylaws inside and out. Buried deep within the complex legalese, I found a loophole. If at least 51% of homeowners voted to change the bylaws, the rules could be amended. First, I rallied my like-minded neighbors who were also fed up with Barbara's nonsense. It wasn't hard to get them on board. Her persistence had made her lots of enemies in our neighborhood. Soon, I had enough supporters to call for a vote to change the bylaws. We held a special homeowners association meeting and outlined the amendments we wanted to make, easing restrictions on fence styles, lawn maintenance, parking, etc. As expected, Barbara threw a tantrum, insisting we follow proper protocols for bylaw changes. With glee, I informed her that we had verified with homeowners association lawyers that our vote to change the bylaws was 100% legitimate. Barbara turned red as a beet, sputtering and huffing in anger, but she was trapped. The bylaws clearly allowed us to outvote her. In the end, over 75% of the neighborhood voted to approve our amendments. Barbara could hardly contain her rage as the changes she'd fought so hard against were enacted. The new rules meant people could mostly do what they wanted on their own property without her harassing them. The first thing I did was rebuild my beautiful cedar fence. As I hammered in the final fence post, I smiled. Knowing Barbara couldn't say a word about it, the tables had turned. Now she had to follow my rules. And the malicious compliance didn't stop there. Whenever I was feeling spiteful, I'd find new ways to follow the bylaws to the letter while annoying Barbara. Got cited for a one-inch-too-high fence? I took it down and rebuilt it at the maximum allowed height of six feet. Cited for visible trash cans? I surrounded them with an approved privacy fence. Parked in the driveway? I made sure to leave cars overnight and on weekends since there was no longer a limit. The taste of sweet revenge drove me to find every petty way imaginable to get back at Barbara while following the rules she used to lord over me, watching her sputter in impotent rage over my violations that she could no longer control brought me endless satisfaction. Eventually, Barbara got so fed up with my antics that she resigned from the Homeowners Association board in frustration. As she stormed off after a heated meeting, I couldn't resist calling out after her. Sorry, Barbara, just following the rules. No exceptions. With Barbara gone, the Homeowners Association adopted a much more reasonable and collaborative approach. They worked with homeowners to find solutions instead of dictating petty demands. Turns out, when people focus on cooperation instead of control, neighborhoods function a lot better. 
I'll always cherish the memory of how I beat Barbara at her own game. The taste of sweet revenge was worth every bit of effort it took to put that homeowners association Karen in her place. She thought she could control my property and my life with an iron fist. But I outsmarted her, using her precious rule book against her. It just goes to show, tyrants often fall when the people they try to oppress band together. A little malicious compliance was all it took to cut Barbara down to size and restore freedom in our neighborhood. So if you're ever faced with an homeowners association dictator, don't despair. Fight back using their rules against them. With some persistence and allies on your side, you can beat them at their own game. The next one is a pro-revenge story. My wife and I had just had our second child and moved into a duplex in an amazing neighborhood with its own playground. We moved in and greeted the neighbors, a bunch of younger people, but they seemed okay. On the first day after moving in, we found that they were gone and had left their seven-year-old on a school day outside our door with a bag of goldfish and a note asking us to watch him while they went out, QCPS call hash one. The neighbors and I got along really well. The old guy next door repaired bikes as a hobby, and the neighbor next door did woodworking and would always come over to see the kids and sent his grandkids over to play too. They warned us that our upstairs neighbors were trouble, with constant traffic going in and out and parties every single night. This was 110% true. It got to the point where we couldn't sleep at night, and we had multiple altercations to the point of full-blown yelling matches. The landlord was useless and would do nothing to get rid of them, so I bided my time. Eventually, one night they came home in their red Mazda 3 and it was destroyed. They must have hit someone and fled, so I called the RCMP to let them know. At the very least, I figured they'd get in deep trouble, but, oh man, I had no idea what I had just unleashed. Turns out the douchebag had a warrant out for his arrest for drug trafficking. He got hauled away in cuffs that night, and Entitled Woman 2 got a visit from CPS again, because they left their son home alone again. This wasn't once or twice, it was every single day. So my wife went digging for names and found the mother on Facebook. Using public record searches, we found out that they owed Easy Home nearly 48 k in assets, as they had taken off from the original address with all of their furniture, including TVs and a huge sound system. 48 hours later, the sheriff was there with a box truck emptying their house. They took the beds, couches, TVs, the annoying subwoofer system, kitchen set, and even the dressers. CPS came shortly after and removed the child from the house. I didn't enjoy seeing him taken away, but they never fed him, and he was always in the same clothing, which was falling apart. We went out of our way to make sure he had full meals when we could. We weren't going to let a kid starve. The douchebag went to jail for drug possession. He was out on bail and hid the drugs in a dresser they took. Entitled Woman 1 went to jail for assaulting the sheriff, and Entitled Woman 2 actually had a happy ending. As far as I know, after she lost her son, she went through multiple programs to clean herself up and started working to provide for her son. I ran into her a couple of years ago, and she thanked me for what I did. I got pro-revenge on the drug dealer and his girlfriend and thankfully helped someone get on the right path. The next one is a petty revenge story. For context, I work at a well-known luxury department store in the shoe salon. To start, let's call this Horrible Coworker H.C. I'd been working here for about eight months when they brought in H.C. None of my team was thrilled, especially considering our boss had said he would stop after he hired co-worker number seven. We work solely on commission, so the more people means less of the pie. This is kind of important later. Her first day inevitably came, and while at first things were okay for about a month, the drama and toxic environment soon followed. In the past, I found it extremely difficult to trust my gut because of my severe anxiety. But this time, I just knew instantly I got trashy vibes from her on day one, and knew I wasn't going to be able to trust her. I won't go into full detail, but here are some general instances for y'all to better understand how much of a trash person H.C. is. She's lied and thrown her team under the bus if it benefited her multiple times. Whenever we called her out on her toxic behavior, H.C. would run to our H.R. department and spin a web of more lies and drama. Our team used to be super chill amongst one another when it came to helping clients, but with her, she was a shark. H.C. would stalk every client and push them to try on shoes and buy them, which sometimes worked frustratingly well, 
and it pissed us all off and made us feel like we were trying to fight for scraps. Don't forget we work solely on commission so this was affecting our paychecks. Not only would HC stalk, but she would steal clients. I have confronted her multiple times only for her to make up some excuse and not give my client back to me. Mind you, our store is prided in the relationships we build with our clients, so this was a giant no-no. She has shown up to work extremely hungover, drunk, or coked up, or all of the above at the same time. She has gotten aggressive with some of the sweetest co-workers I know, and has shoved them or gotten up in their face. Oh, and just being completely uncordial, sh unprofessional to them. HC has messed up countless times with clients, giving them the wrong size or refusing to ever return their items. At this point, it had been over a year she'd been here, and I now hated this job. Every day I came in and saw she was working, too, I was absolutely miserable. We'd all gone to my managers, but there was nothing they would really do. Eventually, we found out that HC began dating one of the managers in our store. In the ethics code, that is punishable by instant suspension and or termination for both involved. We found out that because he worked in the back, he was giving her online curbside sales. I don't know how they did it exactly, but she was getting thousands in extra sales because of this, which is a giant red flag because this is considered fraud. Our LP lead also agreed that it was very suspicious, as did our state HR director, but nothing was ever done. At this point, I was fed up and didn't know what to do. I have remained professional, and I'm a very anxious person who avoids getting into conflicts, so I didn't know what I could do to get back at her for all the crap she's pulled. So at some point on a day she wasn't working, I just walked over to where our business cards were, and I flipped them over backward, thinking she would just flip them back over, right? Oh, how deliciously wrong I was. I found out about a month later from a close co-worker that HC freaked the hell out, and immediately ran to HR and LP, demanding they investigate and find out who did this complaining that we all hated her, and that this was a breach of respect. Well, remember how I mentioned HC would run to HR for literally anything we called her out on or any lies she spun up? Let's just say she was not welcomed with open arms on this. HR just sat there like, really? This is what you're here for? Grow up and flip them back around? And LP was like, Lord Almighty, give me strength. Are you serious right now? to which they actually entertained it and asked two of my co-workers if they did it, which they responded no. The managers then berated her for this and wasting their time. It was mildly petty. I know it's not the most petty thing ever to flip the cards, but it backfired so beautifully, and I feel as smug as Jeremy Clarkson to this day. And several months later, they finally fired her and her manager boyfriend's asses because they got concrete proof of them being together and this situation just added to her case being built against her. Since then, we are all in happy spirits again, my anxiety has lessened significantly, and while I'm still leaving eventually to go into a completely different career, I'm starting to like this job again. Oh, and the paychecks are much better now. HC, if you're here and reading this, I want you to know that it was me that flipped over your damn cards, and we're all dancing over your career's grave right now. The next one is a malicious compliance story. I used to be a firefighter for a volunteer department. The town was small and nothing happened on most days, but I was young and single and I loved the job. I showed up every single time I could. The only person who was there more than me was the chief. As many volunteer firefighters know, when grandma falls down at 3 a.m., you get one or two people. But if there's a fire, people you haven't seen in months suddenly have enough time to show up. Anyway, that department was a mess. People were always bad-mouthing and backstabbing. Training was a joke. You were lucky to get a PowerPoint once a week. Stuff was stolen often. There was once a whole political coup for some reason. Somebody really wanted power in a small-town department in the middle of nowhere. I learned it was best to just stay quiet and do my job. And that was helped when I went to night shifts at my real job. I was working 12-plus hour shifts, sometimes five or six days a week. I still showed up to every run I could, but after seven years there, I was just done with it all. Everything came to a head when I was scheduled for 28 12-hour shifts out of a 30-day month. I was still the second most active member out of 30 people, but I wasn't kissing the appropriate asses, and the management kept trying to get me in trouble. They once threatened to fire me for not turning in some paperwork, and I had to point out that the paperwork had been sitting in their mailbox for three days. They eventually decided to add a stupid new rule. You were now required to sit at the station for 40 unpaid hours a month. Not doing so could lead to discipline and termination. 
I didn't bother, I was about 24 shifts into the month and I did not care about their dumb rule. But I realized that I could make it, so I left work, grabbed a change of clothes, and I went to the department. It was about noon, which was midnight to me since I worked nights. I tried to sleep on the rock-hard beds they provided. Not 30 minutes went by when the training officer kicked the door in and demanded that I get up and help with training. My role? I sat on a hose so it didn't move while somebody else practiced the pump controls. A sandbag could have done just as well. An hour later training finished and I tried to go back to sleep. I was told off again. I ended up hiding in the TV room so I could have some peace and quiet. They found me again and wrote me up, first time in years, for what amounted to not being enthusiastic enough about the job. I endured a lecture while trying not to fall asleep where I stood. I finally got to go sit down when I got a text from the boss at my real job. They wanted me to work that night and wondered if I was available. I thought, you know what, I am available. And I left. A few days later I got a nasty email from one of the guys who wrote me up, telling me they didn't like my attitude and that I needed to think about what I wanted. I thought about it and I realized I didn't want to deal with their crap anymore. So I wrote my resignation letter, went back to the station, gathered my personal effects, and I never went back. The next one is an entitled people story. I work as a claims adjuster for auto accidents. A customer filed a claim after hours, and I followed up with him first thing this morning. I had no info on the vehicle other than what he reported, and I informed him there is a possibility of it being a total loss. He immediately jumped down my throat and told me he doesn't want his car to be a total loss, and he doesn't want me to have it moved to another location for an in-person inspection. I started to discuss an alternative with him when he started cursing at me and berating me, constantly interrupting me, telling me to just pay the claim. If it were that easy of a job, I'd be paid less, and my job would be a hell of a lot easier. I explained that per his insurance agreement, we have to inspect the vehicle before I can make a payment for his claim, and we need to see if it is going to be a total loss or repairable. He continued to be an ass, so I informed him that I would disconnect the call and try talking to him again when he has regained his composure. I hung up and went into a meeting, and he proceeded to call our customer service line over and over and over. He harassed a total of four women and refused to end the call until I accepted his call. I explained I was in a meeting and wouldn't be out for at least another 30 minutes or so. He continued to stay on the line with them for a few more minutes before hanging up and calling customer service again. I finally had a chance to call him back, and I explained that we can try to work with his shop in having them submit photos so we can do a preliminary check to at least see if the car is a total loss or not. He told me he sent me photos from the night before. I explained that there were no attachments to the emails he sent me, and that we need very specific photos to have the most accurate review. He proceeded to tell me it is my job to call the shop and request them, which is what I told him at the start of the call anyway. He then demanded my cell phone number. I explained that I don't have a work cell phone. He stated he wants my cell phone to be able to reach me over the weekend. I informed him I will not be providing that info to him. He demanded it a few more times before stating he wanted to talk with my supervisor. I stated she was already informed of the situation and would be reaching out to him when she is able to. I'm not allowed to give out her contact info. He tells me that I need to have her call him immediately. I remind him that she is my supervisor and I cannot dictate her schedule. He proceeds to try to keep me on the phone until his demands are met. I inform him that I'm going to disconnect the call if there is nothing further to discuss, and he ends the call. I called the shop and they also gave me attitude stating that I was keeping a good man from his job and that I shouldn't be wasting his time like this. I asked if they could email the photos to me just so that I can get it done, and they said they will. I have an uncommon last name, so I made sure to spell it out for them multiple times since it is part of my email address. Two hours before I leave for the day, I still don't have the photos. I texted the customer and let him know, and he told me he would call them. Five minutes before I'm supposed to leave, I call the shop again and don't get an answer or option to leave a message. I texted the customer to let him know that photos aren't received yet and we won't be able to move forward on his claim until Monday. He started blaming me for working in a different time zone, stating it isn't fair that I work three hours ahead of him. I explained that I don't work three hours ahead of him, I'm just one hour ahead, and the shop had all day to send me the photos needed. He now states that since he doesn't have a rental, didn't purchase the coverage, he is going to be fired on Monday, and it's all my fault.
I offered to set him up with a discounted rental, and he tells me he doesn't have a rental company in his area, but it's still my fault for him losing his job. Goodness gracious. You mean to tell me that your employer is so heartless as to fire you for missing a workday unexpectedly when it's your first occurrence in fraction with them? You may want to contact your State Department of Labor then. He tells me I should just pay the claim, and I'm holding up his claim for no reason to make life difficult for him. I wonder what he thinks happens to adjusters who don't follow due diligence on a claim and just pay it. We don't get cookies, that's for sure. In fact, we face termination with our employer, fines with the state the claim was handled in, and possible jail time. Oh yeah. And our employer can sue us for the money we paid to the customer without authorization, and if the customer knowingly cashes the check when they know their claim wasn't supposed to have been paid out, they get reported to the federal government for insurance fraud and sued by the insurance company for repayment of the claim. I guess I'll see what he has to say on Monday. My supervisor has been reading my notes and keeping up to date with the claim, and she is going to have a very fun conversation with him, especially when all the calls exhibiting his bad behavior were recorded. ETA this is a single vehicle accident where the customer hit a large object in the road that he absolutely should have seen. I won't state the specifics in case he's a Redditor. He did not file a police report and he wanted to send me photos from the scene of the accident, which took place at night, and became more irate when I stated I need a VIN photo from the sticker inside his driver's side door. Update. Not too much going on, which is... unexpected. It's been radio silence from the customer, and I don't trust it. I'm expecting a full blow-up. My supervisor called him and left a message yesterday, but he hasn't called her back either. She has informed me that I have her encouragement to put him on written-only communication, and I don't have to answer his calls anymore. She also stated that if he threatens me, which I'm not sure if he will or not, she will get our security team involved and I can press charges against him with his local police as these are recorded calls. I called the shop today and spoke with the owner. I explained how the rep I spoke with on Friday acted very unprofessionally and he informed me that the customer had apparently been calling her non-stop on Friday and harassing her as well, because she somehow thought it was a good idea to give him her cell phone number when he demanded it. The owner is an old friend of the customer, you all called it, but he provided this info very freely, and stated that after this repair they aren't friends anymore, and he will blacklist him as the rep I spoke with is his niece. I got the photos, and there were several very thorough photos. It is pretty minor damage and it is clear that he ran into something on the road. I can't give specifics, but it was a metal object that happened to be laying in the road that got wedged in the undercarriage. They had to pull really hard to get it unstuck, and the shop sent me a photo of the very warped item as well. Redditor Sleuths also called that he has a huge custom item that was not on the policy. It's a bed cover for his truck, but there was no damage to it, and even if there was, we wouldn't cover it if he didn't have an endorsement for custom equipment. I ran this by SIU, Special Investigations Unit, and while they agreed that the customer was acting shady as hell, they don't have enough info to start an investigation, and they stated that since it is a single car accident, we would still be obligated to cover his repairs even if he was lying. There are several states where we can deny a claim if the customer lies about how the accident happened, but sadly, this is not one of those states. I've texted the customer to let him know I got the photos and that I was in contact with the shop, but he hasn't responded, and it's radio silence. Either he's really embarrassed about his actions, as he rightly should be, or he's a ticking time bomb that's going to explode near the end of the week when I'm my busiest just to tell me in detail how I made him lose his job. We shall see. This will probably be the last update, but if anything else happens, I'll be sure to let y'all know. I truly appreciate the support and collective WTF from everyone as it confirms I'm not just being crazy or sensitive. To the one poster who told me that it's my job to handle this sort of thing and I've been trained for it. 1. I have never been trained for this level of crazy, and I challenge you to find anyone short of an orderly at a psych ward to be trained for it. And 2. It is my job to get cars fixed, not to deal with harassment and bad behavior. Let this be a reminder to everyone to be kind to others, especially the disembodied voices on your phone providing a service to you. Thank you for watching. I would really appreciate it if you could like the video and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. We'll see you again tomorrow.